Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. So welcome back to our ongoing build of the Paladins of Chivalry website, that's my 14th century reenactment group. So we're going to add a section, we've already added that video there, and we're going to go to gallery, various options, but we just want a simple gallery, so choose that, and then get rid of the placeholder pictures, quite quick and simple. And then go to upload the ones we actually want, and here they go uploading as we go in real time. This is a selection of a few shots. I've got plenty more to put up, but these range over the past few years, some combat, some individual characters, and there they are. They have appeared. We can, of course, go in to edit the section. We can put them in multiple rows. We can change the format, as you can see there, but I quite like this format, um, three pictures per row, and they're all in portrait format. If you click on them to open them up, you can obviously get the ones that are in portrait in full portrait. And there is another option, of course, because if you want to know what each of these pictures are, you go into the gallery and you can add a title. So this is John of Gaunt. So we're going to call it John of Gaunt and then wait for it to upload. All done. Scroll down, double check it's all there. And there our gallery is complete. It's literally that easy. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakenafel. You can get a free trial, and once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and on with the main show. So this month, the wonderful people on Patreon wanted to know what my five worst ships were for the interwar period. Now, you've probably seen, hopefully, the Naval Engineering Disasters video I did, which is kind of, I guess, a bit like a top 10 of worst design ships ever. And you may recognise one or two entries from there, either mentioned or gone into more detail in this video. But since they specifically voted for the five worst ships of the interwar period, that's what we're going to be looking at today. So the interwar period I've defined as a ship that was designed during the interwar period. It doesn't necessarily have to have entered service because, you know, you can design something in 1936, but by the time it's actually constructed, it might be World War II. But it also means that stuff like the K-Class and the M-Class aren't going to feature because they were both designed and built, for the most part, during the First World War. And since just doing a, you know, basically worst five ships of the interwar period would let's just say rather strongly favour or disfavour, depending on how you want to look at it, some countries over others, I decided instead we're going to do the five ships, but we're going to do the five ships from five of the major navies of the Second World War. So, of course, that's going to be the US Navy, the Royal Navy, the Japanese Navy. And then, of course, we have a little bit of a difficult decision because you've got the French, German, Italian and Russian navies all being relatively speaking large and had taking part in the Second World War. But I decided that we should look at the French and German navies as our other two entries. Yes, the Italians and the Russians both had some pretty awful ship designs, but we can look at those separately uh, because, yeah there are some real shockers in those but nonetheless I'm also going to give a little bit of a lead in and have a look at some of the ships that could have been taking the position of worst designed into a vessel for that nation's navy uh, but didn't make the grade for various reasons so let's start off with the u.s navy there were strong contentions from uss ranger the aircraft carrier that the u.s navy never at any point even when they'd almost run out of aircraft carriers wanted to put into the pacific theater for a whole list of design limitations but she's not the winner of this particular honor because at the end of the day when she went out and fought in operation torch and various theaters in the atlantic she acquitted herself fairly well so she's not a completely awful ship likewise we could have also looked at uss wichita a one-off heavy cruiser that ended up being so overweight generally and top heavy in particular that they ended up not only having to ballast her down significantly more than they'd originally planned, but she also wasn't able to initially receive her designed anti-aircraft armament. And as we all know, an anti-aircraft battery was a fairly important thing for an interwar ship to have, especially one that was being built in the 1930s and was going to see considerable action in World War II. But 
Again, in the end, she didn't actually roll over, they were able to make modifications, and she gave some pretty decent war service. So she's not the winner, if you like, of this category either. Instead, we're going to look at the Sims class destroyer. So a little bit of background to start with. During the 1930s, the US, as with most of the other major signatories of the naval treaties, were limited in the displacement of destroyers that they could build. They could build most of their destroyers up to a 1500 ton displacement limit, and a few to a slightly higher displacement limit of just over 1800 tons. Those Larger vessels had been flotilla leaders, which had been designed with a rather questionable single-use twin 5-inch 38 mount, but that's another subject for another day. US general destroyer design for the 1500-ton margin had settled down on a pretty standard layout. Four single 5-inch guns, two fore and two aft in super-firing positions, and an unusually heavy torpedo armament, usually 16 torpedo launchers in four quad mounts, two per side. This extremely high preponderance of torpedoes was in part because, of course, US cruisers were not built with torpedo launchers outside of the Atlanta class and the Omahas, and therefore the majority of the US cruiser line could not use torpedoes against enemy shipping, and thus if you wanted to have enough torpedoes to match your opponents in a theoretical battle, well, then the destroyers just needed to carry more than everybody else. However, overall, torpedo launchers weighed a little bit less than a gun mount system, because although you had four torpedoes in four launchers, and they all sat on the deck, the launch itself sat slightly lower than the guns, especially a super-firing gun, and therefore contributed slightly less to issues with stability. Plus, of course, you didn't have to have the magazine the hoists, and all the associated shells stored in the ship, although they were further down, that did obviously add up to a fair bit of mass. And once you launched those torpedoes, well, that was most of the weight gone. But when it came to the Sims class, things had changed a little bit. Technically speaking, the US wasn't bound by the 1,500-ton displacement limit anymore, but they tried to have their cake and eat it as well. It was decided to increase the main armament from four single 5-inch guns to five single 5-inch guns, and this newest gun and a midship's weapon would be mounted at roughly the same level as the super-firing fore and aft turrets, so there would be a fairly significant impact on stability as a result of it coming about. Partially to compensate for this and partially for efficiency reasons, one of the quadruple torpedo launchers was eliminated and another one was moved to the center line. This meant that the ship could still fire eight torpedoes on a single broadside, but when it came around the other way, it could only fire another four torpedoes on top of that, as opposed to its predecessors, which could fire a, sp a spread of eight and then another spread of eight. The superstructure and bow of the Sims class were also significantly streamlined and slimmed down in an effort to get the ships up to as high a top speed as possible. Now you might think, for a class that's got no displacement limitations left, this is a brilliant idea. Make them more lethal, make them more efficient, make them faster. Unfortunately, the US Navy decided that they wanted all these benefits, but they didn't want to have to pay any extra for them, and they wanted to have as many as they possibly could. And so, although all these additional features were built in, the displacement that was allocated to them only went up by 70 tonnes. And bearing in mind that the ships had to be lengthened to incorporate the new gun, well, most of that weight and more just went into the extra length of hull, let alone the additional gun, its ammunition, its magazines, its hoist, etc, etc, etc. But determined to try and squeeze a quart into a pint pot, they pressed on, and the first ship to reach sea trial stage was USS Anderson, which you can see has the fifth gun. Unfortunately, it turned out that the results of these design changes were now that the ship was hilariously unstable, to the point of being an active danger to its crew in even moderate seas, let alone heavy seas, and the Anderson had to be rapidly called back into dock to have a whole slew of changes made to it to keep it upright. These changes would have to be retroactively fitted to some of the destroyers that were in the process of fitting out, and some of the others of the class, which were a bit further behind in construction, would have to be completed to the new standard, whatever it happened to be, once they'd figured out how to make sure the ship didn't imitate Vasa. 
In the end, the design changes rolled back basically every single on-paper improvement that the Sims class theoretically possessed. The fifth gun was removed, as was one of the torpedo launchers. Now, of course, with one quad launcher on each wing and one on the centerline, if they took the centerline one off, they'd only have four torpedoes per side, but still have to carry eight, which wasn't particularly brilliant. So they took off one of the wing launchers and moved the other wing launcher to join its remaining compatriot on the centerline. So now the Sims class had an eight torpedo broadside, but that was it. It couldn't wheel around and deliver another eight torpedoes the way that its predecessors could. As mentioned, its main gun firepower was now exactly the same, Although, in happy news for some of the sailors, the super-firing aft mount, which in common with the now-removed amidships mount had been essentially an open-mounted gun, did receive a half-height semi-enclosed mounting with a nice canvas screen that they could put up in really rough weather. But these changes weren't enough. Additional ballast had to be fitted down below, and a whole bunch of splinter protection on things like the fire control director and the forward superstructure, also had to be removed to address the stability concerns. And even with all of these changes in place, there was such a low reserve of stability that unlike a number of other destroyer classes, both before and after it, the Sims received a relatively small upgrade in its light and medium anti-aircraft weaponry during World War II. And indeed the scale of armament that had been envisaged for the Sims class wouldn't actually be seen in full fruition in a design the US Navy was actually happy with until the Fletcher class, which displaced about a third more. So as far as US Navy interwar designs go, the Sims class gets the medal for trying to be more ambitious than the previous classes and actually ending up being slightly less capable through being terribly designed. And next we're going to look at the French Navy. Now, once again, we had some contenders. We have, of course, the French aircraft carrier Bayern, which could have got the award simply for the crime of being Bayern. We could also have looked at the Mogador class or any number of the very late era design contractor pilliers for being destroyers that were capable of absolutely ridiculous speeds, but completely incapable of actually fighting at those speeds. But since Bayern could actually, you know, carry and launch aircraft, which is the main purpose of an aircraft carrier, even if it couldn't do it particularly well, and Mogador was still a reasonably decent destroyer, even if she had to slow down a bit to speeds that were merely very fast rather than lightning, then neither of them will get the top billing, as it were. Instead, we're going to give the prize to the Duquesne-class heavy cruisers. As a product of the early 1920s, the Duquesnes were, of course, France's first attempt at what would later be called a heavy cruiser, although in the 1920s that designation didn't exist. It was introduced by the 1913 London Naval Treaty. Nonetheless, it was an 8-inch armed cruiser that displaced, at least in theory, 10,000 tonnes. And of course, she was built in an era where there was an artificial holiday on capital ship construction, and so the large 10,000 ton cruiser was the newest and largest warship that anybody could build that wasn't an aircraft carrier. Now, unlike the Germans, who were merrily proceeding away with the Deutschland class and praying to whichever deities they happened to believe in that week, that, well, hood renown and repulse would magically poof out of existence should there ever be hostilities. The French were aware of the existence of Hood, Renown and Repulse and wanted nothing to do with them and therefore contrived to have their ship attain a speed that would allow them to outrun said battle cruisers. At least in theory, thanks to the relative size and displacement differences, if you were actually in heavy seas, it was relatively likely the battle cruisers would overhaul you anyway, but hey, medium to calm seas is still better than nothing. So aiming for an armament of eight 8-inch eight guns, which is fairly standard, and a speed of at least 33 knots, as it turned out, maybe even closer to 34, which was pretty good. And with a secondary dash anti-aircraft armament of, after a lot of wrangling and a little bit of size reduction to try and save weight, eight single 3-inch dual-purpose guns, along with eight 37mm anti-aircraft guns in twin mounts, plus some machine guns, which was actually a pretty decent anti-aircraft battery for a 1920s design ship along with a pair of triple torpedo launchers, which gave her some much-needed anti-capital ship punch. The Duquesnes seemed like they were shaping up to be pretty nice cruisers. Unfortunately, it was essentially at this stage that displacement ran out. 
And you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, where's the protection? Well, good question. Where was the protection exactly? Now, some of this was a little bit beyond their control. They wanted to achieve a speed that was reasonably in excess of the British battle cruisers. But thanks to the privations, deprivations and industrial devastation that had hit France as a result of World War One, France's steel technology, which had actually been, if you remember, world leading in the 1870s and 1880s, was now actually well behind the curve of everybody else. This meant that their machinery plants were somewhat heavier than others to generate the same power output. And perhaps more importantly, the strength of the steel that they used in ship construction, which at this stage was essentially what we would today call a mild steel, was somewhat less than what everybody else was using. And what this meant was that if you were going to put a certain amount of stress on a, let's say, steel girder, if you were using French ship construction steel, you had to make that steel girder thicker and thus heavier as compared to other nations' girders for it to sustain the same amount of weight or stress or strain or whatever other kind of load you were putting on it. Now, reducing the firepower was out of the question, which meant that if you wanted to have any serious protection, you would have to reduce the speed, and they weren't willing to do that either. And so with a somewhat less efficient machinery plant than everyone else, and a somewhat overweight compared to everybody else's standards hull, they were left putting a 30mm or 1.2-inch side protection system on the magazines, but outside of the deck and turrets, which were the same thickness, that was it. There was essentially no protection over the machinery and, well, 30 mil, 1.2 inch, when that kind of level of armour is put on Japanese cruiser turrets, it's described is as essentially splinter proof and not much else. And that was basically the case with the Duquesnes. Its armour system for the magazines, you know, the bit that would otherwise go boom in a very dramatic manner, was described as probably safe as long as it was being shot at by a destroyer and as long as that destroyer shell detonated on the outer hull plating well then maybe the it, the armor plate that was on the magazines might actually catch the splinters and stop the magazines going off if the destroyer was using a slightly larger than average gun had a semi-armor piercing shell aboard or heaven forbid the cruiser duquesne or torville its sister ship came up against another cruiser whether it be wielding six or eight inch guns well that armor wasn't going to stop the shells in the slightest in fact the only thing a 30 millimeter plate would do at that point would probably be to confirm that the fuse on an armor piercing or semi-armor piercing shell was properly armed right before it detonated in the magazines and these were ships where 25 percent of the horizontal length of the ship at the waterline was magazines it would also mean that in a fight with a cruiser, if it got to medium or close range, the enemy cruiser's secondary battery, which on most contemporary cruisers was of a calibre somewhere between 4 and 5 inches, would be perfectly capable of perforating every part of the French cruiser except for maybe the box magazines, assuming the gun wasn't particularly powerful and or didn't have some kind of semi-armour piercing shell available. Now, as we've mentioned, there were reasons for this mostly due to the state of French industry. But a reason is not an excuse, and it also doesn't take away the fact that the Duquesnes were hilariously poorly protected. It's all well and good saying, ah yes, but look, we are able to do 34 knots, we can stay ahead of everybody. Well, I hate to break it to you, but a cruiser's job is not to just run away from everything it sees, and when a particularly angry and virulent destroyer is capable of ripping you to pieces if it happens to get close enough, and this was a period when a considerable number of destroyers were being built that could exceed 34 knots by quite a considerable margin, I'm afraid I have to condemn the Duquesnes as fundamentally incapable of doing anything other than acting as an overly glorified large scout, which the French contre torpilleurs were much, much more capable of doing. Although, as luck would have it, both Duquesne and Torville would be in the Mediterranean, specifically at Alexandria, during the fall of France, and thus, unlike a good chunk of their successors, they would actually survive World War II and spend a considerable amount of time in service with the Free French Naval Forces. And now we move on to the Royal Navy. Contenders for this particular spot could be awarded to, say, 
the carrier Ark Royal, which, whilst being a decent carrier, had a number of serious design issues lower down, which would eventually lead to her loss as the result of a single torpedo hit, which is not brilliant. The Aerith user class, for, well, being budget versions of the budget version, and then having the Argentinians come along and order what was essentially a much better version of them. But despite both these limitations, Ark Royal had a relatively decent service career until said unfortunate torpedo, and actually proved herself to be one of the most capable and useful carriers of the early war period. And the Aerith user class, whilst not exactly blessed with a huge amount of firepower, did certainly punch well above their weight in the Mediterranean and Pacific theatres. And so my award for the overall worst ship design of the Royal Navy in the interwar period goes to the York class. Like the Aerith users, the Yorks were designed on a budget, specifically a budget that was supposed to a reduce the overall costs of ships that the Royal Navy was producing, because the Treasury was being fairly tight-fisted, but also, in theory, it would allow the Royal Navy to have more cruisers for the same displacement that it was allocated within the treaty system. But whilst this was technically true, in that you could build six York class for the same displacement cost as five County class, with six York class coming in at 49,500 tonnes and six and five County class coming in at 50,000 tonnes, you'd actually end up paying out more. So you could build five County class and a couple of contemporary destroyers for the price of six York class, at which point you'd actually have seven ships for the same amount of money, if you were building the larger cruisers. And that's not all. Compared to a late model county class, the York class was no faster. It was not really any better protected, and once the counties had had their refits, then the counties were actually better protected. And of course, the counties carried an extra twin 8-inch gun compared to the York class. And when you looked closer at firepower, the late model counties, especially once they'd replaced their single 4-inch with twin 4-inch, had a heavy anti-aircraft battery, and in terms of number of 8-inch guns floating around, 5 county class brought 4 additional 8-inch guns to the table as compared to 6 York class. And the same went for manpower. If you wanted that 6th hull, you'd have to recruit an additional 370 men into the navy as compared to the numbers that you needed to crew your 5 counties. So in the end, the only thing that having your six York class in theory would give you over five counties was that you would in theory have an additional hull which could be in an additional place at the same time. Everything else was more expensive. But then, of course, if you did have your additional hull, the simple fact was that six eight-inch guns was woefully inadequate for the era of the modern heavy cruiser, which is the era that the York class was entering into. Eight guns was kind of a minimum price of entry, and a fair number of heavy cruisers had nine, or in the case of the Japanese, even ten eight-inch guns. So a York class with just six going up against something would be at a significant disadvantage. The more compact hull also meant less ability to absorb damage, and this showed in how they were lost. Although three county class were lost during the war, two of them were lost to overwhelming airstrikes from Japanese carriers during the Indian Ocean raid, that being Cornwall and Dorsetshire. And, of course, HMAS Canberra was sunk at close range by the mass gunfire of an entire Japanese cruiser division, as compared to York and Exeter, where York was sunk following little bitty air attacks here and there, plus an attack by Italian Mars boats, that were fitted as essentially kamikaze weapons, but with the option for the pilot to eject first. And Exeter, although it managed to scrape through its engagement with Graf Spee, was then sunk in a long-range surface action by considerably less firepower than was directed at the Canberra. This, of course, being while she was assigned to ABDA command. Whereas a decent argument could be made that most treaty-compliant 10,000-ton heavy cruisers would have fared significantly better against the Graf Spee than Exeter did, although that's obviously not to reduce the accomplishments of Exeter's crew in that particular engagement. And of course, since only York and Exeter ended up being built, the British never got that additional sixth hull anyway. So in the end, the Yorks are simply a less capable platform in every way except for a slight increase in presence, 
with the caveat that that increase in presence is significantly less capable of actually doing anything when it gets to actual combat. And even this notional, marginal, questionable advantage wasn't realised with their being constructed. And so the York class pretty much has to take the biscuit for me, for the Royal Navy, because they're a completely unnecessary group of ships. And to be perfectly frank, if the British had built York and Exeter as another pair of counties, they probably would have gotten a lot more use out of them. And that brings us on to the Germans. Now, I know what some of you might be expecting. Are we going to see Bismarck? No, but Bismarck was in my top three uh, contenders for this particular spot. So, yeah, Bismarck, not exactly the world's most efficient design, in the slightest. Definitely a somewhat compromised secondary battery. And, well, the arguments over her armour scheme go back and forth between various people. As you probably know if you've watched this channel for any particular length of time, I'm not a particular fan of it. And it is, as I mentioned here, horrendously inefficient and overweight. But, for all that, it could still reasonably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with 35,000 untreated battleships. So, it's not an awful design. It's just a bad one. Then you might be thinking, ah, well, Drac, then I know what you're going to go for next. The Königsbergs, the tinfoil wrappers of the Kriegsmarine. Well, they would be the other one in the uh, selection list, but whilst, yes, the Königsbergs are not the world's best designs, they are very fragile, and they end up getting sunk at a fair old rate, they're not actually the worst of the Kriegsmarine designs, at least in my opinion. In my opinion, the worst interwar German ship design, because the Königsbergs at least have the excuse of trying to comply to the Versailles Treaty limits, is the Type 1934 Destroyer. Now, that isn't to say that some of the other German destroyer designs weren't pretty bad, because they were, but the Type 1934 really takes the biscuit, because it was designed by the Kriegsmarine in a period when the Kriegsmarine had decided we are not going to abide by any kind of treaty limits or restrictions. So you remember the Sims class from earlier on, where they couldn't make five five-inch guns and 12 torpedoes work on 1,500 tons or 1,570 tons, shockingly enough. They did manage to get five five-inch guns and 10 torpedoes working on about 2,100 tons with the Fletcher class, and the Fletcher class, as I've said before, has loads of stability left. It was an excellent design and incredibly adaptable for the rest of World War II. Now we come to the Type 1934s. So let's run a comparison, shall we? Uh, standard displacement for an as-built Type 1934 was just over 2,200 tonnes, compared to the 2,050-2,100 tonnes of a Fletcher class. So the Type 1934 is 100-150 tonnes heavier at standard displacement as compared to a Fletcher. Okay, so you'd expect the Type 1934 therefore to be maybe a slightly more capable. Well, is it faster? Although in practical service both classes do somewhere between 34 and 36 knots, on trials both classes prove capable of up to about 38 knots. So that extra 100, 150 tons hasn't bought you any more speed. Is it better protected? No, the Fletcher is actually better protected because it has quite extensive splinter-proof plating down its sides, which the German destroyer does not. Is it better armed? Well, they've both managed to have five 5-inch five guns, so I suppose that's good. Except the Fletcher class has the 5-inch 38, which is a dual-purpose weapon, which allows it to use it in anti-aircraft defence, and the German 127mm SK C-34 is not. It's surface action only. What about the anti-aircraft armament? Well, they both start out life with 10 barrels, a mixture of 20mm, in the case of the Fletcher having the Orlikon, and in the case of the Germans having their standard 20mm cannon, and in the Fletcher's case starting off with a quad 1.1 inch or 28mm mounting, whilst the Germans have four 37mm guns. Well, okay, the Chicago Piano, the 1.1 inch, is not exactly the world's best anti-aircraft gun by a long shot, 
but if you've seen the video I did on anti-aircraft guns and their comparisons, you'll know that one of the few guns that can claim to be even worse is the German 37mm, at least the one that was installed on the Type 1934s, that being the 37mm SKC-30, which was a single-shot weapon. Well, what about torpedoes? Uh, the Fletcher manages to carry two quintuple tubes. The Type 1934 has two quadruple tubes, so the Fletcher carries two additional torpedoes compared to the German ship. I suppose you could point out that the German surface launch torpedoes tended to work a little bit better than the American ones, at least in the early part of the war, uh, but that's a problem with the torpedo itself, not to do with the number that are being carried. Oh, and assuming that both ships can use all of their fuel, the Fletcher can go further as well. So you're spending an additional 100, 250 tonnes, and thus far we've got a ship that doesn't go as far, can only go as fast, has worse and less overall armament, and is inferior in protection. Oh, but it, it doesn't stop there. You see, the Type 1934 is hilariously top-heavy. Much like the Sims class, except the Germans just kind of leaned into it rather than taking bits off. Part of these measures meant that about a third of its fuel had to be retained as ballast to stop it flipping over and looking at the U-boats, which cut its range even further. And it was also a very front-heavy design, which meant it kept plunging into the sea and taking water over the bow, and so trying to join the U-boat flotillas that way instead. And then, of course, you've got the machinery. The Fletcher class are pretty reliable ships. They'll go happily steaming around the Pacific, and unless you drop a kamikaze on them, they'll probably make it home without any major breakdowns. The Type 1934s, you basically had to, had to be an octopus on Panzer Chocolat trying to play the pipe organ in order to keep everything working, and even then, you'd probably end up as calamari. The single biggest threat to the forward progress of a Type 1934 destroyer when it wasn't in combat was usually its own machine plant. It's therefore probably something of a mercy that of the four ships constructed, three of them were in Davy Jones' locker before the first six months of real fighting had actually finished. The one remaining Type 1934, the Z4 Richard Beidzen, somehow managed to survive the war, um, with its high point being an ancillary escort during the Channel Dash, but somewhat set off by also being one of the destroyers present at the Battle of Barents Sea, aka the Battle of the Kriegsmarine did so poorly in that Hitler tried to scrap the entire service contingent of the Kriegsmarine. It then managed to run aground twice, get bombed, and when it was eventually divvied up as a war prize, the Allies couldn't even bring themselves to use it as an atomic bomb test unit. The British got her as war spoils, and basically just stared at her for a bit before deciding to scrap her. So yeah, the Type 1934 destroyers. How not to build a large destroyer? And now we come to our last nation, the Japanese. Well, we had contenders here, let me tell you. We had the Ruggio, the sole aircraft carrier, which was on the list for attempting to be a loophole aircraft carrier that could you know, sneak in under 10,000 tonnes, and then failed on account of, firstly, getting the loophole closed, secondly, coming in at over 10,000 tonnes anyway, after design changes were made, then found to be far too lightly constructed, as were a number of other Japanese ships, and dangerously top-heavy, before finally getting to fight in World War II, discovering that she could carry very, very, very few aircraft compared to what she was actually supposed to be able to do, mostly thanks to having a lift that was far too small, and that again then getting rather ignominiously sunk by a relative handful of US Navy aircraft. But hey, she was still a carrier, much like Bern, that functioned as a carrier, was able to launch modern strike aircraft even if there weren't that many of them, so she didn't make the top spot. Then you've got the Megami class, which is one of very, very few classes of ships in all of naval history to actually score a negative kill ratio when it comes to active combat, i.e. in active combat with enemy warships in the vicinity, the Megamis collectively managed to sink more of their own side than they did of the enemy. Uh, that includes Megami being directly responsible for the loss of her sister ship Mikuma during the Battle of Midway. But no, the prize doesn't go to either of these. The prize goes to the Hatsuharu-class destroyers. Now again, a little bit of background is required. 
Back in the late 1920s, the Japanese had launched the Fubuki-class destroyers, which came in at about 1,750 tons standard displacement, and they are in many circles regarded as the first modern destroyers of the interwar period. They're one of the first, if not the first, to break with the four single guns idea as a primary armament. They're also considerably larger than most of their predecessors, and they have a very heavy torpedo battery. So you have six five-inch guns in three twin mountings, you have nine torpedoes in three triple mountings, plus they can carry a set of reloads for each torpedo tube, and they're pretty darn quick. They're very, very capable vessels. Unfortunately, they, like Ruggio, provoked a change to the naval treaty system. So once the changes were made as a result of these new super destroyers showing up, that's why you end up with the Sims class having to obey a 1500 ton weight restriction. Because everyone looked at the Fubukis and went, hmm, I'm, I'm not sure we want this trend to continue. The Japanese signed up to the London Naval Treaty because they were still trying to stick by that kind of by that point. And, well, somebody looked at the Fubukis and went, yes, this is a very, very capable vessel. However, the treaty now restricts most of our destroyers to 1,500 tonnes. I know. We shall demand that somebody builds us a ship that has just as much speed, just as much firepower, just as much protection, just as much everything as a Fubuki. But you shall now fit it on a destroyer that is 250 tonnes lighter. And bearing in mind we are talking about destroyers where, compared to a total 1,500 tonne standard displacement, uh, 250 tonnes is one-sixth of that entire displacement. Or, roughly speaking, the difference in displacement proportionally between an actual treaty-compliant battleship and Bismarck. Except, of course, in this case, we're going the other way. Now, this pushed Japanese naval architects past even their limits. And bear in mind, these are the same architects who came up with various cruisers which, when their official displacements were given, caused one very experienced UK naval engineer to say they're either building their ships out of cardboard or they're lying. And it turns out they were pretty much doing a bit of both. Oh, and did I mention that the Hatsuharus were supposed to incorporate two significant advances that had been made during the construction of the Fubuki class, which is why sometimes the Fubuki class is divided up into three subclasses, namely dual-purpose anti-aircraft capable main batteries and the shielded torpedo mounts, as opposed to the open torpedo mounts and single-use main batteries that characterise the first few Fubukis. Because, yeah, they're expecting to fit those on as well. As a result, much like the Sims class, when they were launched, the Hatsuharus proved to be hilariously unstable, and also, in this case, rather structurally weak. After the notorious Fourth Fleet incident, they had to be called back into dock, and a whole slew of changes had to be made. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this design even pushed the Japanese designers past their limits, so they were actually built with two twin gun mounts and a single gun mount for their main battery, so they had, were already down one gun compared to the Fubukis. But once the problems became very clear, they had to relocate that single gun mount. And very soon after war was declared in the Second World War, they ended up taking it away completely. Significant parts of the superstructure were cut down or lowered. The splinter-proof armour that was a feature of the forward superstructure had to be removed. One of the triple torpedo launchers had to be removed. The hull had to be reinforced. Various bits of heavy machinery had to be lowered down either one deck or, in the case of the funnels, just be shortened. And so, by the time they'd finished with them, they pretty much resembled, at least in terms of paper stats, if not necessarily in terms of appearance and weapons layout, pretty much what the Sims class had become. Four five-inch guns as the main battery, with dual-purpose use, albeit that the Hatsuharus used two twins rather than four singles. And although the six torpedo tubes might seem a slight downgrade compared to the eight that you could find on the Sims, you do have to remember that these were six 24-inch long lance, not eight 21-inch Mark 15s. 
Oh, and uh, some of the changes they had to make to the underwater hull form and the rudders meant that speed dropped a bit as well. Indeed, once all the changes were made, there wasn't a huge amount of improvement in the Hatsuharus compared to the Mutsukis, which were a couple of hundred tons lighter still, which were the predecessors to the Fubuki class. Okay, admittedly, the Hatsuharu's guns were seven millimeters larger and could be used in an anti-aircraft role, which the Mutsukis couldn't, but that's a fair amount to pay for 150 to 200 tons more displacement. Oh, and the entire class was lost during the Second World War. Although I'm not necessarily sure you can hold that against the Hatsuharus in particular, there were a fair number of Japanese classes that ended up as complete write-offs during the Second World War, so maybe that bit isn't quite the strike against them that everything else is. And so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. My picks for five of the worst ship designs of the interwar period, as seen through the lenses of picking one for the British, American, Japanese, German, and French navies. If you have other nominations from those navies, or perhaps you'd like to put forward ideas for the Russian navy, or the Italian navy, or one of the other smaller navies, then please feel free to do so in the comments below. But I hope you found this interesting, and if you think there's some kind of redeeming feature about my five picked nominations, please also let us know, because of course, opinion will always vary. Thanks very much for listening, and bye.